and welcome to the Practical Creative Podcast, where I talk to people who are out there actively making and doing creative work. I want to know more about their materials, their processes, what it is that motivates or inspires them to keep creating. And along the way, I'm also learning more about the nature of creativity itself. I'm Jeremiah Craigie, and in this episode, I'll be talking with kinetic sculpture artist Arthur Ganson. I first came across Arthur's work almost 20 years ago, and it just blew my mind. I'd never seen anything like it, and the work that I saw then has remained vivid in my mind ever since. He has a brilliant way of bringing materials to life, and doing so in a way that is humorous, but also pokes at some of the darker, more uncertain questions about human existence. <laughs> I know that's a bold claim, but if you ever get the chance to see his work in person, I'm sure you'll see what I mean. And in this episode, we talk about the importance of having a clear intention when you're making, giving and receiving feedback, and as an extension of that, using that feedback and public response to your work to help refine your ability to communicate through the work. We also talk about the importance of challenging habits and assumptions, and we also get into avoiding feeling self-conscious in the making process. So please enjoy this deeply personal and at times philosophical conversation about the intense focus and energy that Arthur puts into his work. <laughs> okay, so uh, the first thing is just w could you could you introduce yourself? Could you just tell us who you are and what you do? My name is Arthur Ganson, and I am a kinetic sculptor. I make kinetic sculpture, which is a subset of the big picture of sculpture in that it's work that involves kinetic elements. It involves movement. What I do is essentially time-based art. There's a different way of thinking about it being kinetic. So, so why, do you, why do you make that distinction? Well, because I'm most interested in movement and gesture, and I'm not that interested in the physical object in and of itself. Now, that can be a little misleading because yes, I am very concerned about the physical object and all of its attributes and all of that is very important, but I'm primarily interested in an object in transition, how something moves in space and time and what can be communicated with that movement. That's great. Yes, and we as human beings, we observe movement. Uh, and I think what we do is we assign what we call a gesture to movement. And a gesture, when we use the word gesture, I believe that it is a thought about an attitude it is what inspires a feeling in us. So movement is just pure movement. A wheel can be turning in circles at a constant rate, and you can describe it purely mechanically, but you can also describe the movement in a gestural way, and you can describe any movement in a gestural way. Can you give an example of say, the wheel turning. How would you describe that in a more gestural way? I would say you could, you could describe the wheel turning maybe as monotonously incessant or, um, uh, um, it's a good question. <laughs> now you put me on the spot. Maybe that's not the greatest example. Um, well, but, actually, uh, well, let, let me let me come back at you then. I think actually, just as what you're saying, it it as soon as you use the word monotonous, that that describes an experience. Yes. So instead of it just being something spinning, there's there's an experience that we are identifying, and the word exactly. monotony does that. Yes, yes, yes. For example, I remember. Many years ago, and I think I was in Boston or New York, and there was a display during Christmas time in some store window of mechanical uh, puppets and things moving, and everything was moving in the most monotonous mechanical way, and there was no feeling 
present. Nothing was really being communicated. I felt, I felt like, uh, it was, uh, it was just purely mechanical. Would that be like when we see the, um, well, like a cuckoo and a cuckoo clock or, or in eight clocks in city centers that sometimes will have uh, a series of figures come out at, at, at the hour and there'll be a figure, you know, splitting wood and it's a very repetitive, monotonous act. And then there's another figure, I don't know, bending over and picking a pail of milk or yes. whatever, but they're, they, they're, they're meant to reflect life, but in a way they are quite lifeless. Yes. Is that sort of the kind of thing that you're getting at? Exactly. That's what I'm talking about. And I think that the greatest challenge is to transcend the purely mechanical feeling or the mechanical quality to imbue uh, what really is a lifeless object with some sense of life, a piece of my humanity. So that is the challenge, I think, with every piece, is to somehow transcend the pure mechanical device, the mechanical device. Okay. So now you just opened up a whole box of questions for me. For, so the first one is why? Why do it? Yeah, why do it? It sounds like quite a, quite a challenge. And we're so used to seeing mechanical things just doing what they do and never really giving it any extra thought. And because it is mechanical, it is there is a sense of a monotonous repetition. So why give, why give yourself the headache of trying to figure out it, for example, why work with machines where you have that that uh, repetitive nature versus something that is much more responsive, say working with people or working with animals. So you could be a choreographer, you could be a dog trainer, and and work on a whole range of expression with those media that are are, are much more malleable. What's drawn you to <laughs> to this particular challenge? This is a very good question. I think that it's because I come from the place of having thoughts about feelings that I want to express in the mechanical world. So it comes from a feeling place that the, the why, okay, now this is where I'm getting a little bit jumbled here, but, but it's a little bit clear in my mind. Let me just try to get the words out. Okay. If I can sure. say it, if I can say it succinctly that my impulse to make work does not come from machine making. Machine making is more the result of how I need to speak, how I want to speak, because I'm so interested. I've always been interested, even when I was a little kid, in the way things moved. So... The heart of it for me is a fascination and a love for the way things move. And when I started to make sculpture in college, after taking all of the preliminary courses and doing all of the exercises, doing bronze casting and drawing and figure sculpting and working with clay and wood, after doing all of that, I eventually found my way to making machines because I needed to see things move. So by definition, if something's moving, it needs to be some kind of a machine. So I'm coming at it from the point of view, or I'm coming at it from the place of wanting to express feelings. And... I'm not coming at it first as a machine designer or an engineer. Engineering is, for me, engineering is kind of like uh, mixing paint colors for a painter, right? There's the, there's the mechanical, technical level of the art form, which has to do with the material and how, how the physical materials are treated and handled and addressed. And every 
every form has its mechanical properties. There's mixing paint. Uh, there's, you know, with a musician, of course, there's technique and uh, everything having to do with how to actually express on an instrument. I think I'm getting a little bit off the track here, but I think you do. You, no, is this, I, I is this clear? You, I think so. Yeah, yeah. There, there's a difference between the the technique and the mechanics of something. For example, mixing paint versus what you're trying to do with that paint, what you're trying to communicate with that paint, and your interest is isn't necessarily in the mechanics, but in 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 using them as a as a way of expressing something. So you're moving beyond just the mixing the paint into what am I going to put on the canvas? Just the materials that you're using are machines. Yeah. Is that I I don't want to put words in your mouth. Yes. Uh, I, I I felt like that's where you're going. Yes. Okay. So <laughs> then. What is it that that elevates this mechanical movement to to something that is gesture or something that conveys emotion? Because uh, you you do it. I I it's that's what I find so magnificently compelling about your work. Is I mean the first time I saw it, I was just stopped in my tracks by it because it was, and and I'm saying this partly for the you know what your work looks like, but for people who haven't seen it, it it's mechanical, but that's like you, you forget almost instantly because it looks like an assemblage of, of pieces of, of metal and wire and gears and cogs, but uh, you, you forget that almost instantly because there is something happening. There's there's a narrative unfolding. It's very very theatrical. It's very mm. it, it it almost demands that we anthropomorphize it, that we put ourselves into what we're seeing because we're, because there's a there's almost a pathos or or um, uh, a story evolving that we can relate to. There's a very human element to to the work that you've been creating. But w what is it that that takes it from that pile of parts and elevates it, or, or being just a, a wheel spinning? There's something that you do that that takes it into takes it to a completely different level. And I'm just curious to know if you would be able to articulate what that is. Mm. I think that there are many factors that go into it that create a situation that's either more or less successful with that kind of transcendence. So there are many factors. Uh, one, one of them is the nature of how the material is handled. Now, after just talking about how I don't care about material, here I'm contradicting myself. Very much the nature of how the material is handled. And very often, uh, if there's a quality of hand present, uh, then that can be a factor. Now, let me just step back a little bit. I think that you use the word theatrical, and I also use that word a lot. And while you were asking the question, I was thinking that maybe the most important thing is that when I recognized that the sculptures were little moments of theater and they needed to be addressed as such, then I began to focus my energy and think about the structure of the experience, the structure of the piece, and everything that goes into that moment. And um, okay, I had an experience when I was in college when I was beginning to study sculpture and I was also involved with puppetry. I love puppetry and I did puppetry on the summers during college. Well, we went down from our college in New Hampshire to a place called the Puppet Show Place in Boston, and I watched a performance with a rod puppet by a puppeteer named Bruce Schwartz. Now, Bruce Schwartz was sitting at a table in front of the audience, and he had a little rod puppet in his hands, and he performed a little piece called The Little Match Girl, so he had one little puppet. And... Bruce was sitting there wearing black 
at a table and his control of the puppet was so perfect, so articulated, so carefully understood that Bruce Schwartz disappeared because so much attention, beautiful, loving attention was put into this little puppet. And I thought about that after, like, why was that so powerful? And that was because he understood that if he put his entire heart into the careful manipulation of this puppet, that that's where all of the focus would be. Now, I feel like that served as a beautiful lesson for my sculpture making. And without consciously thinking about that, I know unconsciously it has helped to guide the thinking process of the design of every piece. So, for example, the little piece called Thinking Chair, where there's a tiny little chair that's walking in continual circles around a stone. When I was imagining that piece, I was thinking, well, what's the most important thing here? What was the most important thing that I wanted to communicate with this piece? And, and that's also another way of asking, where's the heart in the piece? Because whenever I make a piece, I'm generally driven by my heart to want to make it. So in asking myself, where's the heart in this little piece? It was all in the subtle gesture of how this little chair is walking. And every decision made about how to build the piece was hopefully meant to focus energy and attention on that little chair walking. So there are many components to that. One is the stage. How is the stage presented? And anybody in theater will obviously understand when you have something happening on a stage. Uh, but see, I, I, I'm not, I'm losing my thought here. Uh, well, no, no, no. It, it makes uh, sense that you, because if, if you, for example, it's on a stone and the stone is elevated off the ground and clearly there's a reason for that. And staging is what both gives us context for what we're what, seeing and it helps to focus our attention. There's a reason why we use lighting on, in theater to, to pull and push the focus of the audience So look over here and then look over there, look at everything, look narrow, narrow and wide. So uh, staging is very important to, to focus the attention of the viewer in a particular place or even to create a particular tone. So uh, I guess that there was something that you were, th those were considerations that you were going through as yes. you were making that. Yes, yes. Needing to understand, wanting to have the focus uh, on this little chair. So with that in mind, I knew that I wanted to build a mechanism. I needed to build a mechanism that was as uh, as uh, out of the way as possible, still seen, but but in the background. And in this case, it meant that it was built below the stone. So in order to do that, I knew from the beginning that if I'm going to have a stone raised on a little post and a little chair walking in circles around it, I have to design this mechanism uh, so that it will accommodate a central axle and everything about the mechanical design was based on that so that there was as few mechanical parts above the stone as possible to interfere with the perception of the chair. So, so theatrical focus is one of those things then that, that helps to create the proper environment. I think also, especially with working with wire, there is a kind of inherent sloppiness in wire. 
There's a relaxedness in wire. And things don't move perfectly or exactly. There's, there's a lot of give and take. And that alone creates a tremendous amount of possibility for interpretation. So the movement of the, the movement of the chair as it's walking on the stone, it actually skips a lot. It doesn't take really good steps all the time. It drags its foot sometimes. Its foot. I'm calling it its foot, but it's its front leg. Right? So it's, it's a little bit, it's, it's a little bit sluggish and, uh, it's very inexact. And I think that that inexactness, uh, contributes tremendously to the energy and feeling of the little chair. Absolutely, yeah. I think it's quite interesting saying that the that the wire, because <laughs> I've done some work with wire as well, and absolutely because it can flex and it's not it's not as rigid as if you're working with more machined components. I think that that helps to add to the sense of life because there, there's there's always going to be a little extra bit of movement uh, and the more complex the the mechanism chances are that's going to be magnified as it goes through i'm curious to know could you articulate what you are trying to communicate with that piece how clear it, it's not even that piece specifically but in general when you're approaching a new piece how clear is that that emotion or that intention that you have or is it something that you're discovering along the way most often, I begin a piece with a pretty clear intention of what feeling I want to express with it. And also, sometimes the piece will evolve along the way based on what the material and the piece is communicating back to me as I'm building it. So there's always an evolution in the piece. There's always a development of a piece. If I... I think there needs to be something that I don't know about it in order to make it. And that's partly why I'm driven to make it because I want to see it in real life. I can imagine all kinds of things and I do imagine all kinds of things all day. One of the joys of working with real physical materials is that those imaginations can become grounded. And I love that about the fact that I'm working with real materials, that it's, there's this beautiful dialogue between my imagination and what the real world is saying and doing. So I need to obey the laws of physics. I'm bounded by the affordances and capacities of materials. Uh, and I think that is a very important grounding because it puts the abstract idea into a physical plane in which we as physical bodies are also existing on. So it is, it becomes an extension, literally an extension of my physical body. Hmm. These materials, these materials are, are affected by my hands. And they have been molded by my hands. And once the piece is done, I'm no longer touching it. So there's only a record of me. And the record, I would say, is extremely deep. It involves not only all of my thoughts about the piece, all of my dreams and passions about the piece, but also all of my subconscious thoughts and all of the subconscious uh, aspects of my being go into the creation of the piece. I had a therapist many, many years ago when we were doing all kinds of experiences like psychodramas and things like that. And we would do drawings, uh, and make sculptures as a way of doing therapeutic work. And he would always say the subconscious is always speaking. And I believe that's true that no matter what we do, we, we can have a conscious idea of what our intentions are and that will be expressed. But 
I think maybe kind of like the tip, that's the tip of the iceberg, maybe a much greater uh, portion of what's being expressed actually is the subconscious. That's interesting because it, it, there, there's something about the almost inherently abstract nature of a lot of what you're doing, uh, a, a lot of the work that you're doing, the, the, vo the vocabulary that you have, that it's, it's open to interpretation. There's a very clear intention in what you're doing, but how people respond to it is, uh, it can, can be very personal. And I think, <laughs> actually, that reminds me of, um, when I first saw some of your work, there's a piece, I, I can't remember the name of it, but it's, it's, looks, it's like a piston pumping thick black oil. And it's incredibly phallic and, and erotic. And uh, when I went to the exhibition, this was years ago. This was probably 15 years ago. Um, you were actually there, but I, I was with my girlfriend at the time, and we'd gone to the comments book, and we were we were trying to think what, what to write because our, our like our minds were blown by what we had seen. I, 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 I just didn't have vocabulary left to express myself. <laughs> but I noticed the comment above had been something like. Um, so great, so so erotic, so made me horny, and and you came up and you looked over our shoulder and you assumed that we had written that, and and so you said, oh that's so great because people normally don't feel comfortable saying things like that, and I was too embarrassed to say, oh that wasn't me, that was somebody else, but it's fantastic that it it because um, someone else would have looked at the same piece and just seen the mechanics of it, or or they might have uh, looked at the 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 quality of of the of the oil, which was fantastically uh, unctuous and it, it, it just oozes so nicely over. I think people would have responded very differently to that. Um, so oh, <laughs> no, I'm, I'm, I'm so rambling. curious. Where, my point where, is, <clears throat> yeah, I'm, yeah. Where, where was this? This was in um, uh, just outside of Boston. I, I was sitting in Boston at the time and uh, it, it was somewhere near the MIT. It was a very small gallery and uh, it was just, just your work. Um, and it, it, it was the, I, the <laughs> it was properly mind blowing. I was just never seen anything quite like it. Um, and uh, yes, but I, I think that's that's it. When you're working with, I think that's one of the wonderful things about creative work in general is that we can have the artist, the maker, can have a very clear purpose or agenda. But because so much of what we're doing is expressing that in a material that isn't verbal and that it's using other materials to translate and express that idea, it yes. then allows for more layers than our our conscious mind or the vocabulary that we have can express. And I think that's where the the man-made or the handmade object has so much potential for so much power in terms of uh, connecting to other people. And yes. that's what really excites me about uh handmade objects and, and, and crafts and art and working with materials is that it's an opportunity to express something that is above or below or outside of the realm of the the language that we use to express and understand our everyday existence. It yeah. has potential to carry much more than what you're consciously putting into it. And then we, we can bring much more to it and get much more out of it than perhaps we even consciously can understand. Yes, yes, absolutely. Well, I'm, I'm very aware that in order for a piece to have meaning for someone, they need to bring meaning to it. The viewer brings the meaning to it. So what I'm always trying to do is to straddle a kind of a fine line between complete clarity and complete ambiguity. At the, and I think that if a piece can be both crystal clear and completely ambiguous at the same time, then that is a situation that that is a situation that can be a catalyst for the observer to dream their own dreams and to find their own meaning in it. So um, I'm sorry, I just kind of I'm having too many thoughts like <laughs> jumping That's in right. at the I same time. But uh, what I when I put out my first, when I put out my first little video many years ago, I felt it was really important to say that whatever you feel about it is true. 
because even though I have a very strong feeling about what I'm putting into the piece, I know that it's that it stops as soon as the piece is out there in the world and it's not it's 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 no longer mine uh, and it's meant to be interpreted and I am absolutely open and thrilled with any possible interpretation of any of the pieces really I had a great experience with that particular sculpture I had an exhibition many, many years ago at a small school uh, um, in Cambridge, and I had set that piece and a few others up in the lobby of the school for a few days, and the kids, they're really bright kids, and they were all around me, and they were all interested in what I was doing, and they wanted to help, and, and I remember I took the piece out of the crate and got it set up on the pedestal, and I don't know, there must have been about 10 kids around. And when I finally turned it on and it started to pump, there was this silence that <laughs> that happened because I think every kid understood something about that piece and its erotic nature. And it was so, they didn't really know what to say. <laughs> it was beautiful. What, what age were they? Oh, these were these were like early high school high school kids. You had no um, no qualms about sitting in that moment of uh, awkward silence. Yeah, yeah. And I also had a memory when my son was was an infant. I was building that piece when my studio was in the basement of the house, and I remember I finally got it to work. And this took many tries because I had never built a oil grease pump before so i didn't really know what i was doing so you know i would do something and try it and it would fail and i would think about it and well, what's not working so i would redo it and try it again and of course if you're working with metal then you have to solder or weld something and it's all full of grease there's a tremendous amount of cleaning and anyway a lot of back and forth and i finally got the piece working and I brought my son down. He must have been like two or something or one. And I brought him down and I was holding him and he looked at the piece and he started to squirm. <laughs> and I think there was something just in the physical action that this little being was understanding. And there was no thought. There was, and this was, this is before any, capacity to be sexual or thinking about all of those implications it was just the pure visceral quality of the movement and the material and what was happening so i think that does it's, that piece have a name yeah machine with grease machine with grease just as you're talking about it then i i'll uh i see if you can find a link to the video so people can see it yeah and actually it was inspired by I had gotten a, a call from a friend who wanted to have an exhibition of erotic art. And the exhibition never happened in the end. But the moment she asked me if I could contribute a piece, I said, well, I don't really have anything. But this piece popped into my mind. And I thought, oh, okay, I got to make it. <laughs> I, I want to go back to something that you said about the the previous piece um, with the chair, is that you you... In, in order to communicate the idea that you had, you had you wanted to put the mechanics in the background. And I'm just curious to know, but they were still vis visible. Why have the mechanics such an integral part of the work? And that I, as far as I'm aware, there aren't any that you do that where the mechanics aren't visible. OK, OK. Uh, there are some pieces where some of the mechanics are not visible. So. That is also the case, like in Corey's Yellow Chair, the first version of Corey's Yellow Chair. There's a lot of mechanics that are behind the backboard, and I did that intentionally because it would have been distracting, and it was not interesting to look at, and it just it didn't help the piece visually. Uh, most often, the mechanics are 
right there and I want it to be a part of the perception and understanding of the piece. It is the piece because I don't want these to be magic tricks. I want it to be absolutely clear what's happening. If it starts with a hand crank, it's very clear that you're turning a crank and you see everything that's going on. And if it's starting with a motor, the energy is coming in in that way and you see essentially everything that's going on. And I think the the situation where you where you eliminate all of those questions like how is this happening you eliminate all of those and then it allows for something something deeper to rise to the surface that is even though i can see all this stuff is happening there's something else going on here so i'm partly in love with the machine and love to see mechanical parts in action. Uh, and at the same time, they are really generally subservient to the greater idea. Now, one, when you introduced this question, you said when you're, when, uh, let me see, you used the word expressing an idea. And I think what I, I think what I really am trying to do is not to express particular ideas, but to express feelings. I think there's a difference between ideas and feelings. And my, my pieces generally, it's not a rule, but generally start from a sense of a feeling that I want to express. And that is really at the heart of it. Mm, yeah. So yeah, my apologies. I got no, no, no. It's just, it's just that it's an important, it's, it's a very important distinction because feelings are universal. And in that way, movement is universal. Every human being on the planet understands movement and gesture through the experience of their own body in space their own personal body in space. And I think that this is where all of this com comes from. And this is, I think, what's at the heart of any interpretation of any artwork, my artwork and any other artwork, that a person brings their personal body of life experience to the encounter. And the understanding of the physical world is first understood and primarily understood by the movement of our own bodies, which is just our own bodies are the most beautiful machines. Yeah. The most, yeah, the most complex beyond comprehension, right? What I do is just so trivially simple when you come right down to it. <laughs> uh, that's really funny to hear you say because if, I think if anyone saw the, the mechanics of a lot of what you make they would say that that was not simple by any stretch but obviously yes I understand the point by in comparison <laughs> to the human body so um, that that's that, yeah that, that makes me wonder then where what what do you a, a question that I'm asking a lot of people a lot of people who, who spend their time creating is what do they do outside of that creative work that they feel uh, either feeds back into their creativity or helps to give them space away from it in order for new ideas to emerge or, or to sort of refill the pond or, or refresh their, their, their energy? That's also a really good question. I, I think that for me, the energy is refilled uh, let me just think about this. I want to say that every moment of life is in some way a part of my art practice, that there's no separation between my art making and the rest of life. So I think that is probably the fundamental uh, thing about me is that 
every conversation, everything I see, every moment somehow contributes to that process. Now that may sound like it's kind of sidestepping the question. Uh, and I could, I could talk about other things that are maybe more specific and direct, like so many times during the day and I'm doing something, I'll have a thought about how something is designed not that well, or it could be a little bit different. And I'm constantly dreaming, daydreaming about new possibilities. And so the interface with the world of things that are made by other people offers such a rich environment for contemplation. What were the decisions and thoughts that went into how this particular device, thing, object was manifested and designed? So I'm always just dreaming about those things randomly and, uh, I, I'm also incredibly inspired just by being in nature. Nature is one of the greatest inspirations for me. And I often think to myself, why is it that, that there is essentially nothing that's natural, like an animal or a plant or a geological formation, the way the land is. There's nothing that's natural that's not just inherently beautiful. <laughs> and I think sometimes I've thought when I'm making some of my fragile wire machines, I think about the creation of the piece and how I can allow the piece to grow like a plant as if I wasn't there, which means if I somehow don't think too much about it, what will the path of the development of the piece be? How it can exist as unconsciously as possible, apart from my conscious wishes and thoughts. This probably sounds really confusing at this point, right? because I feel like maybe I just contradicted everything that I said. But I think what I'm doing is I'm making a connection between the impulse that I find in nature, the pure impulse, which is unself-conscious. That's what it is. Nature develops and grows in an unself-conscious way. It's not concerned about anything. It's not a tree is not concerned about looking beautiful it just is because it grows in the most purely organic natural direct way so i often think how can i create my sculpture in the most unself-conscious way possible that that's really interesting because i think a lot of people who certainly that, that I've been speaking to who create work struggle with this question of how will it be perceived or how will I be perceived when people look at my work? And then that becomes a, a factor in the making. And it might, for some people, it's an inhibitory factor. Yes. Um, it sounds yes. like that's something that you're actively trying to, to negate. And I'm wondering if you have any advice or or uh, strategies for 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 working in that way yes i think that i think that that is maybe the greatest challenge of any artist is to stay with that that pure childlike innocent impulse to create and of course the more we make, the more we work, the more we put things out there, the more we're known, all of that, it becomes noise. It has the potential to become noise. And yes, there's all these, like, um, if I start working in a completely different way, then what will people 
think of me. Uh, uh, strategies. I'm sure this is a universal issue. And the strategy, let me just think about this. If I can just say this succinctly. Um, uh, hmm. Oh, Jeremiah, wait, wait. <laughs> There's a kernel of a thought here, and uh, let me let, let me just get to it. Maybe I'm having a little bit of this thought, this this concern right now, because now I'm trying to verbalize something. I'm telling you, sometimes I'm not good at verbalizing, and and this is why I work with my hands. And there's a little story I wanted to tell you about that, actually. So, well, well, yeah. Well, I was going to say, you can tell us the story, and then we can come back to this question. Okay, okay. Let me tell you this, this because I was thinking about about this conversation last night and the last few days, and I was looking at the questions that you sent to me, and I was contemplating them and pondering them. And one of the questions had, had to do with the kind of basic nature of creativity and impulse to work. And... I remember that when I was very young, I was afraid to speak. I stuttered, sometimes pretty badly. I was very uncomfortable. I was very shy. And I found that I could speak more clearly by things that I would make with my hands. So... I would retreat from the world and make things as a way of telling people that I love them, as a way of communicating with people. And that became a natural way of speaking. That became a safe way of speaking. That was my survival mechanism, was working with my hands. And... I just happened to be in an environment where the adults around me, when I was a child, uh, the adults around me didn't really know how to speak to me. They didn't really know. Even though I was, a, I was surrounded by loving adults, there were aspects of me as a young child that were kind of left behind and unattended and not addressed. I think just because those were things that people didn't know how to talk about. So just being so incredibly shy led me to a life of working with my hands as a way of speaking. Now that's not so much the case now. I'm not that shy. I still am a little shy at times, and I tend to like to be alone a lot, but I have also found uh, a life of great direct interpersonal communication, and so I'm, I'm no longer in that confined box, but as a little child, that was how I escaped my box, was with things that I made. So that's at the heart of everything that I do. I suspect that with many creative people, their path and direction uh, was somehow set on a course when they were very, very young, maybe having to do with things that happened to them that they can't even remember. Well, I think and that's, the, yeah, that comes back to, again to that thing of objects having the potential to carry so much more communicate so much more than than we can per, we can consciously conceive of or, or would be able to communicate with language because language it's as fantastically complex as it is just does not do service to the inner human experience we just don't have enough enough words for the, the emotional landscape that, that we're capable of yeah so makes yeah sense that those objects would be a fantastic surrogate, and perhaps even a more articulate surrogate than than language. So that yeah. and it's it's potentially yes. It's wonderful that you've managed to hold on to that 
uh, and and continue to develop that because I think there's also the potential for um, coming to a point where we replace alternative forms of expression, be it physical or or making, and replacing it with a more intellectual and verbal approach. But you, you've clearly held on to that that other uh, means of expression. Yes, absolutely. And I think as a result, when I got out of college, I I really had all I need. Boy, that's not a very good sentence. Uh, <laughs> I'm sorry. I need well, like you say, maybe maybe, maybe we should have done this interview with. Uh, <laughs> maybe okay. we should have done this just by making things and showing them to each other. Okay, no, so, no, it's fine. I, I, they're they're not easy questions, um, and I really appreciate your willingness to engage with them. Yes, well, sometimes I have a really hard time speaking English. So, uh, but when I got out of college, I really had all I needed to just continue working. And I had no desire, say, to go to graduate school where there tends to be a very strong overlay of intellectual uh, gobbledygook uh, laid on the basic impulses to create work so i mean that's that's not that interesting but and i i don't want to get into speaking negatively about anything because all things are possible in this world and there are all and i and i respect uh all of the um all of the impulses and paths that are possible and just because my path tends to be one mostly guided by emotions and feelings. It says nothing about another path that can be fully guided by intellectual thoughts and concepts in, in that realm. So, I mean, it's a great, beautiful world and I embrace it all. I just see that for myself that most everything is really guided by what does it feel like and how does it feel to be doing it? And when I started to make sculpture, when I started to find my, my true nature in making sculpture, I started to make these little machines when I was in college. The, there were so many different things of my being that, being that were coming together in that space. It was in the context of, of art. So I was putting wires together in space and I was doing line drawings in space, little graphic line drawings in space. So from one point of view, that, that could be understood like that. When I was in high school, I was obsessed with computer programming and biology and a lot of computer programming, uh, but I found it somewhat dry and emotionless. Well, when I started to make my delicate wire machines, all of those impulses to want to work uh, with computer programming came into play because I began to essentially program in three dimensions. All of those ideas about cause and effect and flow and creating logical systems that I loved about the environment of programming I was basically doing that in three dimensions with wire, with simple little mechanisms. So that was the second part of that, that I could see now looking back. And then the other part, there was a part of me when I went to college, I was dreaming that I'd become a surgeon because I love to work with my hands. And that was, as I said, how I expressed myself. So when I started to make the sculptures, I found a way of working that required me to be as much of a surgeon as I possibly could be, being extremely careful uh, and very precise and very deliberate with the physical manipulation of the materials and my hands, holding the pieces of wire with my fingers 
in space while I was soldering pieces of wire in place. And this is actually pretty important. The fact that I, I remember that I would, I'd be building a piece and I would be holding a piece of wire, soldering it. The wire is getting hot, but I have to hold it in place long enough for the solder to cool. At that point, I was using tin lead solder, soft solder. So I had to hold it long enough for it to cool. It's starting to burn my fingers. I'm resisting. And even the resisting letting go was part of the building experience that I remember. That's part of what drew me in. So it was very much a physical experience. Do you have a any sort of physical practice? Do you do anything, be it sports, yoga, dance, anything? And the reason I'm asking is that you, so much of, of the way that you are talking and, and communicating is the vocabulary that you're using of, of gesture and of movement and emotion all feel like they're, they're very grounded in the senses. Mm. So I'm just curious whether you do anything outside of the making that that uh, is another expression of that or exploration of this. Well, for a short time, about maybe eight years ago, I was doing really intense yoga, and that was extremely informative for me. Uh, but I would say the most important thing for me is playing music which is something that I do very often. I try to play music every day. And actually, music, playing music is probably the highest expression that I could possibly find of my creative self in terms of the integration of all parts of my being. I talk about things in terms of dance and movement a lot. And I also feel that for me, that also applies to playing music. When I was very young, I was, I learned to play the classical guitar. And, and then much later in life, I picked up the violin and the fiddle and I've been very focused on that instrument. And I think what I love about it, what I'm drawn, or, the reason why I'm drawn to that is that it essentially is dance. It is such a direct connection with my body. It's my body moving in space. So when I'm playing music, I understand it as much of a form of dance and movement as anything else. And I can approach that pure physicality at times now when I'm making sculpture, physical pieces, uh, I have some of those experiences when I'm bending wire. I can sit at my desk for hours and bend little gears. And there's something just so satisfying about the physical manipulation of the wire and the making. When I was young, I used to knit. I love knitting. And this is kind of a related to knitting, I guess. And it's a, it's a way of, of working where my hands are moving and I'm thinking about, I'm always thinking about the most efficient way to hold the wire and to move my hands. And so much of the, the creation of the gear has to do with the feeling, the subtle feeling of the wire bending with the tool. So, yeah, so it's very, it's very, it, it can be very physical. It's a bit harder to uh, experience that pure physicality and dance quality when I'm doing some kinds of work now, if I'm cutting pieces of steel and things like that, like if I'm putting pieces of steel into the horizontal bandsaw and cutting it, and that's what I have to do. Um, it's it's a little farther away, but still there are creative possibilities, and I find all of these activities inherently interesting because I'm always thinking about 
how can I do something more efficiently? What is the most useful way to structure time and events in order to come up with the final result? So I think I'm, I'm, I know that I'm meandering a little bit here, but also I would like to say that I am very much a dancer at heart. And when I was very young, I was so afraid to move my body and dance. But it is so much in me. And now, as an adult, I can have moments where I just love to dance. And actually, when I was practicing yoga, I was, I was finding a way to practice my yoga and dance at the same time. Do you practice yoga? I do, yes. Yeah. yeah. Not, not as, <laughs> I can't say it's a daily practice, but it's something I do. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, so, so you understand what it is. And what I, what I found in the time that I was really heavily doing yoga that I found a way of even like at the beginning of class, I would always start off in child's pose. And while I was waiting for class to begin, I was, sitting on my mat in child's pose. I love to just start that way. And I found that what I was naturally doing was beginning to move my body extremely slowly and essentially dancing on a micro physical level so that probably nobody in class would even ever know that this was going on. But I, I was having a complete experience of dancing. It just happened to be happening on a micro level, micro movements, extremely tiny gestures. And in that very quiet space, even the slightest gesture, the slightest movement of my hand is incredibly satisfying and full of intention. That sounds like a great point to come back to the question of yeah not being self-conscious and just whether or not you'd be up for giving a, have another stab at any advice on how to avoid being self-conscious. Yes. It sounds like you, both in terms of the making, but also it, it, I get the feeling that you, you aren't uh, inhibited by a great deal of self-consciousness when you're, when you're doing things in, in a physical way to so be that yoga or be that making. Yes, well that's interesting. In those in those situations, I think I've over time I've worked through my self-consciousness. So I I think that the the way that I've dealt with it is to let go of whatever thoughts I'm having and enter into the essential experience of the moment. So my self-consciousness is whenever it's there and it's there a lot in many different situations, it's always a fabrication of my mind. And I have learned enough now that the way for me to move away from a place of being self-conscious is by diving into the activity and letting go of my thoughts because I've learned enough to know that my self-consciousness is a comes from all kinds of thoughts that have nothing to do with it, and they're all really about fear. So if I have no fear, it means I'm in a state of unself-consciousness, and I'm able to do and be the most honest person, and do I can do the most honest work and be the most honest person. I have a deep experience with being self-conscious and being fearful. And it is much more in the realm of playing music. And I think that developed because of how music was introduced in my life and how it, how I came to it and what the circumstances were. And there were things that happened when I was really young, some of which I remember and some of which I don't, which which created fears and false stories that are in my mind 
that have become kind of the bounding box for me. And I feel like one of the things that I'm working on very much now is releasing myself from those, those constrictions and those lies and letting go of those fears. So I know deeply what it's like to be self-conscious and I'm working on that really every day. I can be very specific about a few things and I'm, I'm sure that many people have had similar experiences. Uh, when I was introduced to the guitar when I was really young, it was the first instrument that I ever experienced someone playing live in front of me. My dad's first cousin was a, was a dancer from New York and she was married to, at the time, a flamingo guitarist. So the first time I ever witnessed the guitar played, it was this relative, uh, Howard David, uh, who at that point was Juan David and he was playing the flamenco guitar in our living room and I was just blown away. I was captivated by the energy and the passion and there was something in there that just opened me up to possibilities. So I started taking classical guitar lessons and in the context of taking the lessons, I needed to give recitals and all these performances. And there was so much anxiety that, that was built up around the performance of the music that that ended up really inhibiting and getting in the way of the core passion I had for playing music. So music was introduced as something you learn to perform. That was the context in which it was introduced, as opposed to it could have been music is something that we share together in dialogue, which is not about performance at all, just purely about dialogue. And there certainly are many situations and many people and many cultures where kids grow up in an environment where music is a shared communal dialogue. And it's not first about learning how to perform something as well as possible where there's judgment involved. So I have spent much of my life working on identifying those false beliefs which reside in my body as feelings, right? All of these, all of these experiences we have reside in us. And I can feel like when I'm in situations where I'm about to play music with someone, which is something that I some that I have all different kinds of experiences now, but very often I'll have an experience where I have I have a deep PTSD anxiety experience. And I know it goes all the way back to childhood. Even though the adult in me just wants to have fun and communicate and share those childhood PTSD, and I use the term PTSD because I think that that happens on many levels. It's not just uh, having to do with a reaction to being on the battlefield. PTSD, I think, happens on all kinds of levels, and I've, and I've identified that with my experience. That's interesting because uh, another question that I've been asking people is, do you believe that everyone can be creative? And part of the reason I ask that is because I meet a lot of people who say that they are not creative. And my assumption, uh, which I'm testing by, <laughs> by asking people, is that, that a, a lot of people end up developing that belief because they've had an experience when they were younger that has pushed them to believe that they are not. Yes. Uh, and I'm, I'm curious to, to hear how, how particularly people working in the creative sector, uh, respond to that. So yeah, I'll, I'll put that to you. How, do you, do you believe that creativity is universal, that everyone can be? And if so, why, why isn't everyone? I would say 
that not only everybody can be, but everybody is creative. So I can see how in our society, we've made a kind of a false segregation between the creative people and the people that are not, right? And that gets drilled into us. And as you say, people have had life experiences where they're told they're not creative. Uh, I absolutely believe that it is the human condition that we are creative, that we are actually much more creative than we even know we are. So if you were to ask one of the people that said, oh, I'm not creative, you say, well, you're coming up with sentences and thoughts and you're sharing ideas and you're moving your mouth. And really, the when you if you look at simple conversation, right, there's no difference between the conversation I'm having with you uh, and that of a musician playing jazz. To me, it's on that level. So the potential is there. The potential, the natural inclination, I believe, is that everybody is even more creative than they know. And what I mean by that is that I don't think people realize how much they have fabricated their reality. That anytime we respond to something around us, anytime we look at something and have a thought, anytime we hear somebody say something and have a thought about it, our thought is an invention, unbounded potentially, but certainly bounded by the framework of someone's cultural orientation and life experience. So I think about, I think about this question of creativity a lot when I'm thinking about the kinds of conversations we have in society about religion or politics. And I'm probably going to offend some people here, but, um, but to me, all religions are essentially fabrications. They're structures, just like any fabrication and structure. And it's not apparent if you grow up in an environment where something is taught to you as the truth, that that becomes the starting point. And of course, you can you can have all kinds of interpretations about what this means or what that means, and you can take it in different directions. But sometimes the most basic question is not even asked. And that basic question is, are you aware that all of this is a fabrication in the first place? That's a very, um, that's a very Buddhist question, isn't it? Like, what, what is reality? What is our perception of what is and who is perceiving? I, 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 absolutely. It is very Buddhist. And when I, when I found my way to Buddhist literature and teachings, I felt a great resonance with that attitude. And I understood that all conscious thoughts are fabrication. And that's not a judgment of them. It's just a realization that that's what they are. That it's a fabrication, and there's no, and there's no uh, universal or infinite truth to any thought that I have beyond my own experience. It is true for myself, but it's not necessarily true for anybody else. And I think that that's maybe that's what gets expressed when I'm making my sculpture. That I understand that all of my Thoughts and ideas that go into a piece are what they are, but they're essentially meaningless to the observer. Which then puts it back to what you're saying at the beginning, where any response to your work is valid and that you're open to any response to it. Yes. And it's, it's also interesting that, that, uh, the, the, this, and I think this probably applies to every art form, the making of art. And for me, the making of sculpture, it's an abstract language that I've learned to speak over time. 
And it's a personal abstract language. And I believe that maybe every artist has the potential of developing their own personal abstract language. What I think is, is really important is to listen to the reflection because that helps to understand how well we're speaking and it helps to understand what we're communicating. So this is like the dialogue between, between me and any observer of the work is important because I'm making art because I want to communicate to people. And it does help, and it's very important to listen to the reflection, because that helps me to tune the nature of the abstract language. That's really interesting. Yeah, because, so, mm, I'm just wondering, where do you draw the line between the potential for judgment how people respond to your work may be judgmental. They may not like it. And going back to that question of being self-conscious in the making, not taking that judgment back into your work process and allowing it potentially to push you off center or off the direction that you, you want to be go going in. So how do you get a balance between yes. staying true to what you're trying to communicate, but also allowing space for the, the responses that people are giving you to your work. It is a very tricky thing. It's not a simple thing to do. And I think maybe I'm getting a little better at it. Uh, I think that we can make a distinction between helpful criticism and observation let me see. Let me just try to answer. This is a really good question. And, um, I don't want to, I don't want to kind of, uh, muddy it with rambling. Well, you've already made a really, but you've already made a really good distinction there between criticism and observation there. They are different. And I think part of it, it's the intention between them is different. Yes. 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 The intention. Now I find that when I have witnessed responses to my work uh, that are kind of secondhand or not with me right there, I think that those can tend to be more honest. Uh, but that's not saying that a response directly is, 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 is not honest. Um, but there is something to be said for uh, feedback that, that comes that isn't directly to you because then you know people aren't trying to couch it in nice terms or, or yeah. in a way yeah. that they're, they're worried about offending you. Because the artist isn't there, chances are things are, are a little more honest. Oh, okay. So here's a thought that I find that when I'm giving feedback to a student, if I'm doing a workshop or a studio visit or something. When I'm giving feedback, I consciously stay away from any thoughts about whether I like it or don't like it. What I, what I do talk about is what experiencing the work brings up in me, what it catalyzes in me, what I'm coming away with. And that's not a judgment at all. There's no judgment there. That is observation. Uh, and I'm also always careful to say that I am experiencing this while I witness this work because this is who I am and this is what it brings up in me. And I'm just one of an infinite number of possible responses to the work. So I think there's no agenda other than simply sharing what is catalyzed in my being. I know that it's a, it, it's a very challenging and difficult thing, right? To, to, you know, we're all, we're all looking for affirmation, right? We're all looking for love. We all want what we do to be accepted and embraced and, uh, I think that's a very human 
quality. And I don't believe, unless we're some kind of a super evolved guru that, that we're not on some level seeking that connection. And I think that had, that's really, that's really the human connection. So when, when you do get, uh, how, how do you deal with negative feedback? Well, I'll give you two different experiences and the first one, <clears throat> I, I've tended to basically get positive feedback with regard to my sculpture and my art making. And I will, I'm going to get to the negative. I'm going to tell you an interesting story about that. But I first want to say that, and I'm being really honest here, that as a shy little kid, when I started to make things, and I found that I could really impress people by what I made, then that became kind of like a drug. And that I, I kind of got hooked on that. And I think that is the trap of positive feedback is that it can become so intertwined with the ego. And if the ego is caught up in needing that positive response, then it inhibits pure creativity. And we've talked about that earlier. <clears throat> but, but I will say that when I started to make mechanical sculpture, I ended up without really trying to, it just kind of happened, making the kind of work that was somewhat unusual and unique. And I got a lot of positive feedback for it. And that's been wonderful, right? I mean, as an artist, I, it feels great to be embraced. So that's all good. And the fact that I have had a lot of positive feedback and been embraced, that, that, that has kept me going. So I am like not a guru in any way that I, I, I will admit that I, that I have been affected by that two, 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 two little stories about feedback now, uh, or three stories about feedback. The negative feedback with my sculpture ended up not really being that bad, but it was really kind of a grounding. I remember I had an opening at a place called the Berkshire Museum in Vermont. And during the opening, this older gentleman came up to me, and at this point, we were actually outside the gallery where the reception after the opening was actually outside. And he came up to me, and he, you know, after all these people were saying how much they love the work and all of that, I, and this guy came up to me, and he said, so is that your work up there? And I said, yeah. And he goes, it doesn't make any sense to me at all. I don't get anything out of it. And then he kind of walked away. <laughs> and it was a little shocking at first because he didn't have to say that. But what that did in that moment was really help to ground me. And it was a reminder that this is all just, this is all just made up and that whatever thoughts I might have about how good or bad my work is it's it doesn't mean anything it doesn't mean anything and i embraced that negative comment as much as i embraced all the positive comments that day and i feel that's really important well that's interesting as well because i think some people would discard it because the, the majority were positive and that's what they're looking for. There are other people who would be, who would choose that one out of the many positive, the one negative, and that would be the sole focus. Where it's interesting that you are taking them all almost as, as on an equal level. Yes. Of equal merit. Yes. 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 And I believe that they really all need to be taken equally. That being said, listening always listening to 
the response, always being aware of the response has always helped me to com- to understand how well I'm communicating and what I'm actually communicating. So it's helped me to kind of tune how the work is. Not, not so that it can be um, more popular or anything like that, but it can be better that, that, that the feelings can be better communicated. Uh, and two other things. One was, I remember when I made the first version of a piece called Machine with 23 Scraps of Paper that people can see on video. The first version was a little piece that I called Prayer Wheels. And I don't know why I called it Prayer Wheels, but it kind of felt something like that. And I had a whole series of little cut out brass wings that I had painted white on top instead of scraps of paper. And I had some kind of simple mechanism. And a good friend of mine who's also an artist in the Boston area, he, his comment to me was, you know, the, the little brass cut out wings, it's kind of like using the same word in a sentence twice. I thought about that. I thought, you know something, Ross? You're right. That was just such a beautiful piece of feedback. So I was able to take that and understand something about my own work through his observation. And that was very helpful. Fantastic. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And the flip side, of course, is that I, that, and this more has to do with that musical, that somewhat damaged musical child. When I was in maybe third or fourth grade, the entire school was in the choir, except for four of us that were asked to play tetherball instead. So, <laughs> oh, that's pretty hard. So that was that was a piece of negative feedback that stuck with me and created a kind of an unfortunate schism in my being that I'm still working through. <laughs> and I'm sure I'm sure people in your audience have all kinds of experiences, personal experiences in all different ways having to do with their response to the work. And I think ultimately it comes down to our, our need to be loved and seen. I mean, yes. Cause that's, that's sort of at the core. That's a very human thing to, to, to want to be accepted and to be seen and acknowledged. Yes. But we all also have experiences where that hasn't happened. But I think what's really inspiring about the way that you're approaching things is to not necessarily give those negative experiences any more weight in your life or try trying to. It sounds like you're certainly working on trying to find a balance so that they're not they're not guiding and controlling your life and but also not allowing uh, an imbalance of of ignoring them either. You're acknowledging that they're there, but you're also not giving them too much power. So you're challenging them. So, okay, is this something that is useful to me? Is this something that I need to have? Because, yeah, the, the things happen as we're, we're growing up. And despite right. all the best intentions of the people around us, we interpret things differently or they're, the things uh, are communicated in a different way and we're received in a different way. Yes. And that can, that can, like you say, you talk about being bounded uh, by some of those things, but there comes a point where you can look back and go, well, actually, is like, for example, music, music doesn't have to be a performative thing where it's one person in front of an audience. It could be a very sociable, uh, collaborative experience. And that, so there, there, there are a much wider range of definitions of creativity or the expression of creativity and what, what it is to be an artist or to be creative. Yes. Um, that we, we, we have to sort of reassess as we go, go along. So, uh, as a, an example I have for myself is that for years I thought I couldn't draw because to me drawing was being able to put on paper what I could see through my eyes. And I could never do that. I could never make the, the house that I was looking at appear on the page in front of me like the artists that I had seen before. But, that's a very narrow definition of drawing and that's it's a very specific definition that's useful for some people right, in certain arenas right. but that's not by any stretch the full 
the full right. um, definition of what drawing is. Exactly. Drawing can be so much more, exactly. and it can be so much more expressive. Why do it have to be exactly. exact? Why does it have to be draftsmanship? So it, it's challenging those assumptions that right. we've grown up with or that have right. been passed on to us. And right, exactly. Questioning is, is this really valid? Yes, right, 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 right. Oh, I can't draw a straight line, right, right. <laughs> What does that mean? Right. So as you say, is it valid? Is it valid? And so many of the things that we are grown up thinking are not valid. Right. And it's hard for us to see that everything that we understand and the entire structure of our mind has been culturally uh, uh, shaped by our society and our condition. Right. So mm -hmm. to one person, uh, Pablo Casals is the greatest musician, right? And to somebody else, uh, it, it's, it, it can be not at all as profound as, like, if you, if you take a child in the city who's grown up in, uh, a world of rap music. It's a completely different cultural place, or you, I mean, I, I've, I'm interested in so many kinds of situations, musical situations, and they're, they're all interesting to me. And it's interesting how the, the conditions of all of them are, are, uh, you know, create, create, um, overlapping but distinctive worlds. So what, what is what is meaningful and good and moving and interesting in one context is not at all in the other and that's okay right because it's not a statement about the art itself but it's more a statement about the cultural context in which it's understood so i spent many years in the boston area uh studying irish and scottish fiddle music right and i just got so deeply into it and and became very attuned to like particular Scottish styles of playing. And it's all very interesting to me. And very often I would share this with people that didn't know much about that music. And they had no idea what I was talking about, <laughs> about the subtle differences between the Cape Breton style of playing and the Highland Scottish style of playing. And, and so, so what, what, what I, I could find incredibly beautiful in a, in a moment, in a passage, was was opaque to somebody that was that had not been in, uh, immersed in that environment. So, and I think that applies to all art forms, and uh, mm. certainly applies to my sculpture as well. Um, I, I I'm I feel thankful that I have that I have been able to make a life making sculpture and uh, I've been able to touch some people and I haven't touched other people and it's, it's all good. And I understand that culturally that, that there, there are a lot of people on this planet that will look at what I do and have the same exact reaction to as, as this gentleman did after that show. It's like there's, what is this? What is this? <laughs> well, I can tell you, I find it delightful. I find it. I, I, that, I think that's probably the best word for for your work. It's it's it, it captures all of those things that I described it as at the beginning. It's there. There is narrative. There is pathos, uh, which is not a word I use often. I feel like it's, it's a funny word in my mouth, but it, it, there is that. There is. Um, a sense of empathy with something that is inanimate, mm. it, which is extraordinary. And I think it's wonderful that, that you're able to do that. Um, and and uh, I'm, I'm going to put links to some of your videos of your work. And if people have the opportunity to see it, it I, I encourage them to do so because it is absolutely magnificent. Uh, Arthur, we, we've gone all over the shop on this, in this interview, and I, I really want to thank you for engaging with these questions um, in such a considerate way. And I just have two more questions for you. The first one is, do you have a challenge for listeners? Yes, yes, I think I, I do have a challenge, and it really does 
connect, I'm realizing now with a lot of what I've been talking about. And I think it's a, it's a writing challenge that is to, to think about the first time you felt profoundly inspired by something, whenever that was as a child, as an adult, but maybe go back to that first point where you had an overwhelming feeling of being inspired and to write about that and write about what that meant, write about what it felt like and also write about the, the dreams that maybe you had at the time and maybe even consider dreams that you are having now when you recount and relive that initial deep, deep, innocent wonder. So, okay, now there are actually, I was thinking that there are kind of three parts to this, mm -hmm. this, this exercise. So the first part is what I just said, that is to write about it and to, so to, to really flesh it out. And your audience, I'm sure, consists of all kinds of people that are either to various degrees in touch with their creative self. So maybe this would apply more to people uh, that feel a longing for their creative self again. Perfect. So to, 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 to write about that beautiful experience and to manifest it and to make it real. And then the second part, and this is really important would be, and this was actually inspired by a conversation I had with my wife. And I was talking with this about her with, with, with her. And that is to share this writing with someone that you trust to take it beyond yourself, beyond your own mind and to share it with a witness because I think the moment we do that, it brings it into a different realm. So the second part is to share what you've written with someone that you trust just for the experience of sharing it, taking it outside of yourself. And in a way, this is maybe it's somewhat connected with the act of confession in the Catholic tradition. It's connected with the notion of confession, mm -hmm. but it's not a religious, particularly religious thing that I'm talking about. It's a spiritual, emotional thing. So the third thing perhaps could be to contemplate after the experience of sharing or maybe during the experience of sharing and contemplate what experiences as a child perhaps could have inhibited that beautiful creative inspiration and passion and joy fascinating yeah i think that would be yeah, a really really interesting exercise for people to to engage with i have another um, thing too so arthur just okay you have the last yeah, question okay but 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 i have another thing which is also feels important too because i wanted to talk about okay. this too it's a different kind of thing it's related but different and that is which this is this addresses misconceptions that we have uh, honest simple misconceptions uh, that that we have all the time in the process of working and i find that this happens to me all the time when i'm working that i will have a thought about where the starting point is i'll have a thought about what the givens are of the situation and i'll begin to work from that point from those givens and sometimes I'm not aware that some of those givens are not actually givens that I thought they were givens so one of the hardest things as a creative maker is to identify those beliefs those false beliefs that don't need to be there that actually are inhibiting factors to new pathways and that is more on the level of, of working within the structure of creating the work. It's hard to, 
hard to strip away all of the assumptions and their habits. So mm. one of the challenges perhaps is to maybe identify some habits that you think are fundamentally true. One of the things is identifying ideas that are, are that, 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 oh God, see now I'm trying to phrase it in a way. I, I, I think I can see where you're going though. It, it's yeah. trying to identify those, the space assumptions that we think have to be there in order to do what we do, you know, create or to go through this a particular process that may not actually need to be there. Yes, yes. It's going deeper yes. into you, you, the process. Yes, yes. You're saying it so much better than me. <laughs> <laughs> like I can see, I can see where you're going. Yeah, I have a perfect example of this. When I was making Margot's Cat, which is this piece with a little chair that's flipping and flying over a cat. Okay. When I was first developing that piece, I was thinking randomness, randomness. It's got to be random. So I built this structure with the cat. It was a little box that all this had all this complicated mechanism inside of it because I thought that the cat had to move randomly kind of back and forth to excite the chair. And after I was all done with this process, and it took me at least a couple of weeks to do, I looked at what I had done and I realized, oh my God, this is so noisy. It's, it's just so, uh, it's, it's, it's taking away from the essential feeling of the piece. And I had to get to that point to realize that no, I don't need a random movement of the cat. I actually need an incredibly regular movement of the cat. So I ended up putting it on a table that was reciprocating back and forth, left and right, in a very consistent way. And the simplicity of that reciprocating motion finally helped to really accentuate the incredible organic and random nature of the chair moving on it. So my initial thought about how to structure the piece and what was important and what I had to do to build it was based on a foundational thought about randomness that was incorrect. So that's a concrete example. That's just a simple concrete example. Brilliant. And there are many of Aren't those. There? there are so many of those that happen all the time. <laughs> I'm sure there are. Yeah, uh, we're gonna have to. Okay, so we're gonna have to do a round two at some point. Okay, we're so your last question, your other question. Oh, the no, last question is just really simple: is that if people want to learn more about you, or see some of your work, where could they find you online? Well, I have a lot of work at my website, which is my name ArthurGanson.com, and I have videos linked. If you're in the Cambridge, Massachusetts area, there's been an ongoing exhibition of the sculpture at the MIT Museum, which is at 265 Mass Avenue in Cambridge. It's open every day from 10 to 5, and there's close to 20 pieces working. Hopefully they're all working. Maybe some of them won't be working when you get there, because the law is if it moves, it'll break. So, <laughs> so yeah. So there's there's work in Cambridge, and at the moment, there are a few other pieces in different museums here and there. And but so the website's the best place to start. Yes, the website is the best place to start. Yes. Brilliant. Well, Arthur, I I just can't thank you enough. It's been oh an absolute just fantastic uh, conversation that we've just had. So thank you so much for taking the time um, and, and for putting up with my questions. I really, really appreciate it. Oh my gosh. Thank, thank you. I've really enjoyed this conversation. I feel very kind of energized and excited to get back to work. <laughs> oh, great. Yes. Well, please do. Cause I can't wait to see what you come up with next. <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay. Thank you. Okay. Take care. Hey there! Thanks for taking the time to listen to this episode of The Practical Creative. If you'd like to learn more about Arthur and his work, you can visit the Practical Creative website at thepracticalcreative.life, where you'll find images of his work and links to other material. 
And if you'd like to have a go at Arthur's Creative Challenge, you can find a written version on the Creative Challenge page. Just head on over to the website and check it out. And if you've enjoyed this episode of the Practical Creative Podcast, it would be great if you would subscribe to the show, leave a review, or just follow me on Instagram at Practical Creative. Also, just really quickly, if you're interested in ceramics or makers with an uncompromising approach to their work, then check out my Q&A with Gareth Mason. Gareth is a ceramicist working with a highly distinctive and powerful visual language that challenges the limits of both the clay and the audience in equal measure. You can find it over on the Practical Creative website. Mm -hmm.